you all witnessed what happened this morning, the opening of the statement, but we will ask each of the panelists to say a brief, uh, make a brief statement, and then we will open up the questions. Um, I'll begin with Mr. Uh, uh, Dalham Doctors. Thank you very much, uh, Jim, and good morning, everybody. Let me start by warmly welcoming you to the Economic Commission for Africa headquarters uh, in this beautiful city of Addis Ababa, home to ECA, the AU, and we rightly call it the capital of Africa. I'll also to welcome you to this press conference on the uh, economic, Africa Economic Conference. This is, I think, our uh, 12th edition, probably, doing it together with the African Development Bank, the uh, United, United Nations Development Program, and ourselves. Let me start also by welcoming our colleagues, uh, Dr. Celestine Monga and Lamin Mani, to this press conference. You know the, uh, this edition of the African Economic Conference is on governance for structural transformation. As journalists, I'm sure you've been covering governance of this continent for so many years. You would remember so well 30 or probably more than 30, 25 years ago, governance was perceived in our continent as externally driven. It's a conditionality by Britain with institutions and others, and maybe also conditioned by bilateral uh, partners. But the experience of this continent of the last 30, 40 years, the military coups, the dictatorships, and all that, taught us in the continent very important lesson that you could get your macro right, you could get your sectarian policy right, but until and unless you get your governance right, none of these things will work. So the realization, the discovery of governance becomes an African issue. It's no longer an externally driven agenda. And with that understanding, the continent from around the beginning of this century started addressing its governance in a very serious manner. And you know so well one of our very important initiatives and, in, and an instrument addressing governance, the African peer review mechanism, is an African invention, it's an African uh, instrument. There is none of its kind in the world. The closest to it is the uh, peer review mechanism of the DAC committee, which is not on governance, it was on compliance, on environment, on transport, on issues of technical nature. But none, nowhere in the world, there is a country that has opened itself to rigorous peer reviewing by others like the APRM. I think it came about because of that realization. We knew we made progress in this uh, sphere of governance. Today, I don't think there is any country that you could call them absolute uh, totalitarian regime and all that. Election is the name of the game. It is being held everywhere. They are far from perfect, but we know so well governance and democracy, these are issues you cannot learn them outside practicing them. You have to rise and fall in this process. Governance is not a linear process. It has its ups and downs. But I think in that sense, we are moving in the right direction if you discount time. We started experimenting with multi-party democracy, with all that, over the last probably 30 years. The longest will be from the dawn of independence around the early 60s and all that. Those who came uh, before us in this process had experimented with liberal democracy, whether it is in Europe or America or uh, other parts of the world, 200, 300 years. Yet there is no more model that you can emulate. You take the French presidential with American or the uh, mixed hybrid of the Scandinavian of social democracy or the cradle of democracy UK where you have hereditarily uh, house, the Lord is not elected. So as Africans, I think we will ne by necessity be democratic, but democratic is different from the rest of the world. We will find our way. The basic global tenets of democracy, respect for human rights, the traditions and all that are the same. But I think context matter. 
the democracy a nation or governance a nation that chooses, it has to accompany its uh, history, its culture, its circumstances, and all that. I think with this uh, probably brief remark, we'll be very happy to listen to your uh, uh, questions, uh, comments, and all that. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamdel. Uh, let me hand the floor over to uh, Mr. Mane to say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Jimmy. Let me also join my voice to that of um, Dr. Amdok uh, in welcoming um, all of you to this press conference and also to thank the journalists for giving us uh, uh, this additional space. I think uh, Dr. Amdok uh, has covered um, uh, much of the ground. Um, much of the issues that we are concerned with. I mean, and this comes in the heels of the opening address. We've had from the, the, our eminent speakers, particularly um, Professor you know, Joseph. We've had about definitions of um, you know, governance and why this is a timely conference. So I will try to be as brief as possible. In recent years, I have taken a keen interest in, in governance. I am a trained economist, uh, went to some of the so-called very good universities, trained in modeling, uh, in perfecting you know, plans. Um, I started, when I started my career out of the IFIs that I started with, the UN, um, one of the things I came to realize very quickly, I work in countries like Liberia. Uh, I think I'm so, Professor Joseph was coming there at the time I was there. I was a young, young economist. Um, right after the end of the first phase of the Civil War, we were tasked to put in place a reconstruction plan for the country. Uh, this was in 1996, 1997. So we thought um, the scene was set for a, normal, uh, for a normal pattern of development. Uh, I was task manager for putting in place the reconstruction plan with colleagues from the IMF, World Bank, and bilaterals, multilaterals. We were all so happy with it. Before it was launched, all hell broke loose again. The civil war started. And underpinning that uh, is an imperfect, uh, is a very deficient democratic transition. So I think as uh, Dr. Amdok has said quite eminently, um, you can have the perfect plans in this world. You know, you can have the best um, economic, economic programs. But if the governance framework uh, is not favorable, you won't go anywhere. So for me, this is a very important lesson. And uh, when you, uh, governance has been defined in many ways, but basically what it means is managing the affairs of countries, individuals, and the continents. So when we look at that definition, um, you know, governance is at the heart of, I believe, everything. And it confirms what uh, Dr. Amdok has said. Without getting it right, uh, we wouldn't be able to get other processes, you know, right. Um, a lot of literature, as I said, has been churned out on governance and development. And I think over the past few years, as Professor Joseph has said, following the trajectory of this continent, we have seen, you know, how either governance or misgovernance impacts on Africa's development trajectory. Um, you are also aware that over the past, the 15-year period preceding 2014, Africa has a really uh, registered significant growth rate. Some people put cold water on it. Some people probably over-exaggerate. But I think maintaining consistently the growth rates of 5%, and some of the countries actually had gone much beyond that, including Ethiopia, that should be seen as a significant achievement. And one of the factors behind that favorable development is when the continent actually, as a whole, not, a, not across the board, uh, put the governance issue right to some extent. I think we've heard from 
the colleagues that uh, we have democratic transition. It's not perfect, but at least we have been able to, to make a good, um, good start and maintain it. There have been setbacks. Uh, so the, 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 the point that I would like to underscore at this point, there is no question that governor, getting governance right is key to Africa's development. Um, my last point uh, relates to transformational governance, structural adjustment. Why structural transformation? Because there is no doubt that governance and normal development are closely interrelated. But now, what we have realized from the last episode of Africa's growth performance uh, is that the, the Africa rising story has almost come to an end in 2014. So what happened or what has not happened? It is very clear that uh, the continent was riding also on the commodity you know, prices. Um, there is no question about that. In our analysis, that is 30%. Uh, governance is key. Uh, so what, I, what has not happened is that the continent had not succeeded in transforming its economic structures, thereby creating multiple legs. So if one leg uh, you know, weakens, then the others can, can hold. Uh, and this is why now we are interrogating, um, embarking on a more sustainable transformational path for the continent. Uh, what are the requirements of it? One of the key requirements, again, will be transformational you know, governance. So it's not a normal uh, governance processes, but a governance you know, processes that aims at truly transforming many, many things, processes that you've had. I don't have time to go into them. You've had all of them. So this is why we should see the importance of this you know, conference. We are going beyond the normal um, concept of governance. We are interrogating how we can make the governance processes more transformational so that they can support the next episode of Africa's growth, which we believe should be and could be transformational and uh, inclusive. In the UNDP, we had spent a lot of time. This is one of our key focus areas. Uh, since the, the 1990s and early 2000s, we have drawn attention to the critical importance of um, you know, governance and later on working with uh, institutions like ECA uh, and ADB. We have been supporting and um, academicians like uh, Professor Joseph, we've been working with the African government. That's my final word. Um, we shouldn't see the work that we are involved in uh, as controlling the processes. We are supporting the government. As the Ethiopian Prime Minister have rightly said, there has to be and there is more autonomy on the part of the African you know, government. So as they embark on the next phase of the continent's transformation, there is a room for us to support that process with the kind of analysis you know, that they are doing. And I must say that in conclusion, the African leaders must listen also to the work that has been done. And we are encouraged, encouraged that that is, that is actually been done. So this conference, I believe, will take things to higher heights. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mane. Uh, we now pass, I now pass the microphone to Thank you. Uh, my guess is that the journalists are more interested in asking questions than listening to us. But uh, since you're giving me the floor, let me take a couple of minutes to just say that the first time I came to Ethiopia, I was 23 years old. I was a student, and there was a major African Union summit here. At the time, it was called OAU, not AU. And something unusual s s kind of surprised me. Of course, I had little money. And I had to pick one of the cheapest hotels I could find in town. I remember very well. It was called the Blue Nile, $35 a night which was fine with me, except that the next day I discovered that my neighbor in that hotel was Mr. Basil Gisu, who was then the senior foreign affairs minister of Burkina Faso. 
the senior minister of foreign affairs of Thomas Sankara. Of course, I asked him, what are you doing here? This is a $35 a night hotel. Well, he told me it's good governance. With the Sankara regime, we really spend little money and we try to be humble. He told me that Sankara himself was riding as president the smallest car that you could find. It was called at the time the Renault Saint in Ouagadougou. That was quite puzzling to me. And of course, uh, we became good friends. We are still very good friends. But whenever we meet, I also will ask him, this frugality, that good governance that you've been practicing for so long, what are the implications and the results for your people and for your country? My point in telling this small story is just to say that for me, good governance, gov good governance and structural transformation are two sides of the same coin. I don't think there can be any structural transformation without good governance, but at the same time, I think that good governance is also, in many ways, a reflection of structural transformation. And that brings me to the point that I was trying to make in my uh, opening remarks earlier, which is really to broaden this notion of governance, and not to just keep it to what excites people and what interests journalists uh, who are here and make headlines. Important issues of corruption, of course. But I think that the way you manage your country, your economy, to be successful, <laughs> to lift people out of poverty, that's part of governance. I think that, as a macroeconomist, if you have the wrong exchange rate policy, you're doing bad and poor governance. To me, that's as bad as if you were stealing money. So I think that honest incompetence, it's an issue that we need to take seriously. So I'm trying to broaden this approach to governance. So let me stop here and give the journalists the opportunity to challenge Abdullah Hamdok, not me. <laughs> I don't think you'll get away with this one. <laughs> but, OK, um, we have about 10, 15 minutes for questions. Uh, please let us know the media you represent and direct your question to any of the, uh, the three panel members. Mr. Vice President, Celestine Monga. Oh, sorry. My name is uh, Idris Lynch, and I'm working for ECOFIN Agency. Is a press agency covering finance and economics matters in Africa. We are Geneva-based. Uh, my first question goes to the Vice President, Mr. Celestin Monga. It looks like in his, in his words, there is not one governance which will help for structural transformation, but many kind of governances that could lead to that uh, structural transformation. Can you just provide us some few examples in Africa where we can say governance practice has led to structural transformation? And my second question goes to Mr. Hamdonk. Sorry if I, <laughs> I didn't explain well your name. What do you think will be the cost of this governance for structural transformation? Because uh, in one country, the country where I'm living in, what we can see is that every action taken for good governance is being financed by international donors and so on. So what do you think would be the cost and how that could be financed? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to, to ask my question in France. Moi, je viens du Gabon. Je suis Yves Laurent Goma. Je travaille pour uh, GabonActu.com. Uh, Gouvernance et transformation structurelle. Euh, moi, j'ai beaucoup apprécié la présentation de M. Célestin Manga dans la salle concernant la gouvernance. Quelque part, il a dit que la gouvernance 
les discours sur la gouvernance n'ont pas tellement arrangé les économies africaines. Euh, en tant que journaliste, on a beaucoup observé que les pays où il n'y a pas suffisamment de démocratie, c'est là où il y a aussi beaucoup de problèmes économiques. Euh, un premier facteur, notamment la multiplication des mandats des présidents. Les présidents qui restent longtemps au pouvoir pour gouverner, sans véritablement faire progresser l'économie. Alors, ici, nous, avons, nous sommes au siège de l'Union africaine, où chaque année, tous les chefs d'État viennent montrer des beaux costumes, faire des beaux discours. Et là, pour cette conférence, nous avons la chance d'avoir euh, le PNUD, euh, la, 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 euh, le CIA, nous avons la BAD. Pourquoi vous, institutions qui gérez, qui connaissez les, tous, tous les facteurs macroéconomiques en Afrique, ne prenez pas la résolution de faire un grand lobby au niveau de l'Union africaine pour que toutes les constitutions africaines, aucun chef d'État ne fasse au-delà de deux mandats. Regardez cette question de limitation de mandat, comment ça détruit un pays comme le Burundi. Donc, ma principale préoccupation, c'est vous demander à vous qui gérez l'économie africaine, pourquoi vous ne faites pas une opération de lobbying pour que les dirigeants africains ne fassent pas au-delà de deux mandats. Merci. Ok, merci beaucoup. Uh, yeah, where is, uh, no, no ladies are asking questions today. Oh, they're not here. <laughs> ok, I think the gentleman at the back. Bonjour tout le monde, merci pour cette présentation. Je suis Hicham, à la de l'Agence de presse africaine, correspondant au Maroc. Je voudrais dire, il faut toujours sauter cette bonne, il ne faut pas dire bonne gouvernance, parce qu'il n'y a pas de mauvaise et bonne gouvernance, il y a une seule gouvernance. Un. Deuxièmement, j'ai une seule question, comment peut-on surpasser ce, ce, cette notion de gouvernance en tant que mode éphémère de, cette, de ces, ces, ces dernières années. Merci. Ok, merci. We'll take one more uh, at the back again, and then uh, we'll uh, give the chance to the panelists to answer. Merci. Je suis Ismaël Abba du journal de l'économie sénégalaise. J'ai une question. Vous l'avez dit tantôt. Euh, la gouvernance est le socle de la transformation industrielle. Et le dernier rapport de Mo Ibrahim indique que la moyenne pour les pays africains, elle est légèrement supérieure. Je suis tenté de vous demander, à quand alors le développement des pays africains Ma deuxième question, c'est quoi le concept normal d'une bonne gouvernance Merci. Merci beaucoup. Um, so let's give the floor now to the panelists to respond. I think the first question went to Dr. Bonga. Yeah, uh, thank you. The question was if, uh, yeah, the question was whether I could give you an example in Africa of a country that has done well on governance. Yes, I could give a few, but let me pick just one. Mauritius, in my view, in many ways, it's the most successful African country. You know, I worked for a long time at the World Bank. As you may know, I'm a very proud uh, former World Bank staff. Uh, but there was a famous report on Mauritius commissioned by the World Bank in the early 60s by Professor John Mead, who later got the Nobel Prize in economics. They sent him to Mauritius to see what kind of strategy Mauritius could consider. He came back, wrote a famous report which, in which he concluded that Mauritius was a desperate case. There was nothing to be done. It was basically a small Iceland completely lost in the Indian Ocean with no natural resources, uh, left very far away from any market, and really uh, he couldn't 
find anything that Mauritius could do. Well, the great people of Mauritius didn't see things that way. They were not intimidated by a powerful economist who was sent there by a, the most powerful development institution in the world. They simply decided that they would look at what they have and maximize it and organize themselves uh, to create wealth and try to share it as widely as possible for their people. And I noticed that, well, uh, in the history of the world, industrialization is always a must. There's virtually no country in the world that has done well without going through industrialization. Now, industrialization in 2017 or 18 doesn't have to be the same kind that was done 100 years ago, even 50 years ago. But industrialization is a must uh, because that's where you have high productivity. And as a country, when you manage an economy, what you really want is to bring all your resources or most of your resources from low productivity activities, areas, sectors into higher productivity. And typically, it's moving from subsistence agriculture, which we have, or informal sector, and push them in many ways into industrialization and then into services. That's the way it works, because that's where you have high productivity. And that's how that gives you growth, and that's how you create wealth, which is sustained. So the great people in Mauritius uh, were trapped into sugar cane. They said, well, Let's consider industrialization. And they went to Asia, and they invited people who were very advanced in the kind of industrialization that they could do in Mauritius. They invited them to visit the country and help them and teach them how to do things. Now, they didn't choose highly sophisticated industries in which they had no skills or no capital. They said very wisely, let's pick the industries for which we have the capacity. They look at their labor force, most people with low skills, a lot of people illiterate. They said, we need some industry that can employ these people. And that's how they develop textile. And guess what? It worked brilliantly. Mauritius today is a country with a GDP per capita of about $10,000, a country that was considered a basket case. So yes, that's, to me, good governance, uh, really, uh, in all its splendor. Uh, of course, there was a political dimension that Mr. Lamine Mane mentioned, democratic drive, um, the need to understand that whenever possible, you need to bring all kind of voices around the table to build consensus for whatever you want to do. And they added to that agenda the broader economic agenda. What do we need to do? Even if we have a nice political entity, if people are hungry, you will have them on the street. So they understood the need to broaden governance to things which they could do and be successful, and they did it. So that's an example. Thank you. Uh, the up. Thank you very much. Just following from what uh, Dr. Celestine Monga has mentioned, I think the, the, there is a question from the first speaker about the cost of governance. It is indeed, governance is not cheap. Take just one example, elections. Elections is probably the most serious and the biggest undertaking a country can go through probably outside war times, because it engulfs the entire country. It is an extremely expensive undertaking. Putting institution in place is not cheap. It, it has to evolve. It takes time, building capacity of institution, their quality, and all that. Take another example, retention of public servants, getting them remunerated at the right price, and all this. These are requisites for establishing the, the right climate for good governance. And I think it is not cheap. But we have to realize that if you don't do it and you don't pay for that, the alternative is to be engulfed with bad governance, 
waste of resources. The resources you are saving in putting in place institutions of good governance are far much less than the waste. Uh, Dr. Uh, Monga talked this morning about the 30% of corruption and all that. But it's beyond that by much half, far in the sense that the wastage through uh, issues of malpractices and uh, weak institutions and all that, it is very high. So I think we need to get to that realization. But also, most important than this, I was so impressed with an interview together, I think it was a press conference, with the president of Ghana and the president of uh, France, which was in the uh, social media over the last two days, when the president of Ghana was talking, it is hard time for us in the continent begin to take our destiny at hand. The idea of relying indefinitely on the goodwill of the taxpayers of France or Europe or America to come and fund our development, our destiny, it is nonsense. This will be handouts. No country will develop through that. We have to take the burden of this at hand. Your second question on the term limits. I think this is a very important question. If you look at it in, in a democratic sense, term limits in itself, it's neither here nor there. Whether you have uh, two terms or ten terms or three terms. Because if you look at the Prime Minister of uh, UK or the Chancellor of uh, Germany, could stay in power indefinitely as long as they win elections. But of course, democracy has its own beauty of correcting itself, renewal of leadership and with the traditions and all that. But most important for us in the continent is the respect of the Constitution. You are elected on certain rules of the games for two terms. You cannot change the rules of the games halfway by changing the Constitution, by going for a new, uh, fresh thing, throwing a line and all that. As long as we respect our constitutions, term limits not become an, um, a secondary issue. The issue is not limits, really. It's about respecting the rules of the game and respecting our uh, constitutions. I would like to also maybe say a few things on the uh, question raised by uh, a colleague from Senegal on the issue of governance definition. Professor Munga and this, uh, Dr. Munga, this in the morning talked a lot about the, the difficulty of uh, measuring governance and all that. I think this issue has evolved through time, and today we have objective measures of governance. One of them, which I'm quite familiar with, is the uh, Ibrahim Index of Africa Governance, which produced by Mo Ibrahim Foundation. The definition, which is very pragmatic, they took is about defining governance as an outcome of public policy, stripping it from all the uh, complexity of getting a definition and measuring it as how government are faring in various areas. And here they talk about four categories, safety and rule of law, if I could remember them, human development, sustainable economic opportunities, and uh, participation and human rights. These are four categories aggregated to an index of 100, and by and large collecting uh, data, both with um, perception data and hard facts in about 100 indicators. That way, you will be able, day in, day out, to measure governance in an objective fashion. And if you treat it that way, you will be able to trace progression or regression in, in, in your governance status. But also, as the motto goes, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve on it. So however deficient the measures of our governance are, they help us moving in, in solid fashion in addressing some of the deficiencies, and particularly if you look at the disaggregated picture of the indicators. I think we should move beyond also the, the false impression or uh, expectations of precision. You are increasing by the 1.23%. It is not, it's not helping that way. You should be aspiring for a trend. Is it going upwards? Is it going downwards? And that will help you gauge some kind of uh, an understanding of where 
you are uh, heading. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Mane wanted to comment on any of these issues. Thank you. Uh, very briefly, um, on the countries that have <coughs> recorded successes, I think I, I agree with, uh, with Dr. Monga. I also worked on Mauritius for eight years. Then I was with the African Development Bank. I was desk officer for the EPZ program. And those were from those early um, you know, stages. Um, what, he, what he has narrated is very correct. You could see the, how the democratic process gradually took hold. I won't go into all the elements. Um, I also witness, you know, their use of visioning, and everybody sticks to that. But what I also want to say about Mauritius now, when I hear some of the, uh, the, 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 the information coming on the democratic process, I think uh, Dr. Monga will agree with me, you know that a few months ago, F almost every minister was resigning. And uh, you would tend to reach a conclusion that the democratic process is, uh, is collapsing there. I think that also shows that um, you cannot rest on your laurels. There will always be drawbacks, you know, on the trajectory. But by and large, Mauricio's example is quite... And there are also other examples. I can say Senegal. When you look at the process in Senegal, the democratic process, again, not perfect. When you look at Tanzania, when you look at Namibia, you know, we can derive some... Uh, encouragement from their experiences. Uh, on the cost of uh, elections, uh, this is also an issue on which I had, um, we had focused on within the context of Rwanda. I know people always, you know, Rwanda will invoke a lot of emotions, either negative or positive, but there are good successes there as far as democratic process is concerned. I think what Mr. Amdok has said, two things he said. Um, we can complain about uh, the cost, the cost are there. Uh, as they always say in the case of education, uh, complain about the cost of education, but look at the cost of ignorance. Uh, the same thing applies to the processes of uh, building up our democracy. Elections are expensive. Uh, so when you hear that in, in DRC, the $1 billion, uh, you know, it's, it's frightening. But what Hamdok has also said, the countries themselves should not continue they will always need assistance, but they should not always continue depending on external assistance. They should try to fund as much as possible. And that's why the Rwanda case comes in. Rwanda has introduced a lot of innovations, which actually has resulted in reducing the cost of elections to one third what they could have been under normal circumstances. Take this from me. You know, and some of the innovations they have introduced is election volunteers, you know, the use of um, ICT for, for, um, for registrations. You can use a simple phone and just register. Of course, it's not the <laughs> Alakenia case. Um, so I think the countries themselves can also look at how they can reduce the cost of the election so, so as to meet the objective of what Dr. Amthok has said. There has to be some, in large measure, there has to be some the level of self-reliance. Um, self so these are some of the points I would like to raise by way of contribution. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, looks like uh, we are out of time. Um, uh, we will probably have a, another session uh, during the conference. But if you need to talk to any of these dignitaries, please uh, approach the communication officers of the respective uh, organizations so they can arrange uh, with you. But I'd like to thank all of you and uh, hope you could give us good coverage. Thank you.